The title is Assessment of Extra Capacity Required of Alternative Energy Electrical Power Systems to Completely Replace Fossil Fuels. These are the metal prices that the World Bank tra uh, tracks to look at the health of the industrial ecosystem, the base metals, precious metals, and energy, oil, gas, and coal. Now, I've overlaid these metal prices to the number 100 and the month of December 2001. Now, there's two very important points to come up here. So we've got a relative period of stability, and in around 2005, we had a blowout. The metal price is the handover point between those who extract metals from the ground and turn it into minerals from the ground and turn them into metals, and those who buy those metals and manufacture goods. So you're looking at the heartbeat of the industrial ecosystem. So I make a case that this blowout started uh, with a chain reaction in the oil industry. A major economic correction in 2008 was not enough to resolve the underlying volatility. So whatever this is, it is not speculation. It is structural. The industrial ecosystem is evolving, and this change started 17 years ago. It's not something that might happen in our future. So I took the same data, but now I've actually pinned it to January 1970 and the number 100. You can sort of see there's the pinpoint. We've got data back to 1960. And this shows the blowout of what actually happened when the United States currency decoupled from the gold standard. A, a few years later, the 1973 uh, oil embargo happened, and they were able to throw money at it to solve their problems just by printing money. All currencies became fiat. And so that's zooming in right on that point there. So you can sort of see there's actually two points. The industrial ecosystem has had quite a big change. This is again, January 1970 and the number 100, but this is just base metals. So these patterns can be seen in, not in the mining industry as well. So you see a period of stability, but then we had the blowout in 2005. These are the energy resources, 1970 again. So you can sort of see the, it, it's a pretty clear pattern. There's a blowout in 2005, and there's the decoupling from the gold standard, and there's the petrodollar, and that's zooming in on it. The system is changing. It is valid to look at this stuff. We wish to replace oil. We're going to phase out fossil fuels. And when I came to Europe uh, seven or eight years ago, I used to go to the European Commission and uh, in Brussels and sit in on these meetings where the most amazing amount of money was actually put into these presentations. But they were all platitudes. The, there was no substance to any of it. Now, we actually want to phase out fossil fuels and we want to transition away and we want to replace it with a new system. There is very little understanding of what fossil fuels is doing for us now, like what is our dependency and also our vulnerability. So this is actually the discovery of fossil uh, oil uh, back to 1900. And as you can see, most of the oil has been discovered in the decades past. This tall part here is the Gawa deposit in Saudi Arabia, the largest oil deposit the world has ever known. The chart on the right is the same data, but now it's put in a cumulative percent uh, curve. Now, this uh, red is discoveries, and blue is production, and green is the difference between the two. Since uh, maximum point of net dis uh, inventory add happened in 1985, and since then it's been declining. The other point here is half of all oil ever produced has been produced since 1992. So to actually zoom in on the last couple of years in particular, this is a study from Rystad. We've actually got, uh, um, we're not discovering that much oil and gas these days compared to a couple of decades ago. And in fact, I've got a chart that shows that most of the time we're actually using more oil than we're discovering. So we're depleting. 81% of the existing producing fields are in decline and they're declining an average uh, rate of 5 to 7%. And the of the largest 10 modern producing fields, the youngest was discovered in 1976. So here's oil production at the moment. So as you can see, there is a peak in 20, uh, 2019, 2018, but this could be an artifact of COVID. To split it up, these are the countries that are actually still expanding. Uh, well, it's only five countries. However, uh, everyone here 
except for the United States Conventional Oil and the Canadian Tar Sands, uh, they are expanding with everyone else on this chart as she peaked in 2019. That could be an artifact for COVID. In fact, COVID has provided the perfect camouflage. We actually don't know and we will not know for another couple of years. So, but if the United States and Iraq were excluded, then global oil production would have peaked in 2016. Everyone else is in decline, including Saudi Arabia. That's the pink line across here. So this is actually what we need to replace. And what this is showing is we don't have 50 years to get into this. We really need to get into it now. Here's where we're at the moment. So this is uh, production and consumption. The current peak at the moment is November 2018. And uh, then a few months later, we had uh, COVID and the COVID lockdowns. And that has provided an artifact in the system that is just not sensible in any way, shape or form. 2019 might be the last sensible year of data that we've seen for a long time. Since March 2020 though, demand exceeded supply 73% uh, of the time. So here's oil price. Now this has been adjusted for inflation. So there's a couple of points where we're bouncing between the oil prices too high for consumers and too low for producers. The oil price needs to be high enough for producers to be economically viable, but low enough for consumers to actually access that oil in terms of, in a way that allows uh, growth to happen in the current system. So this is what I actually published in 2019 in uh, my oil report. The idea was the, the oil industry window of viability was closing. And so how have things happened since then? Well, that's what we look like now. This uh, gray band is the COVID pandemic lockdown. So I've got I now split things up into eras. This pattern was created as a consequence of the blowout in the metals in 2005 market that I sh showed earlier. The chart in the middle is created as a consequence of a system held together with quantitative easing. And the third pattern has been created as a consequence of the lockdowns and the supply chain disruptions, which has completely cooked everything. So we've got multiple eras. So when we come out of the COVID pandemic formally, what will be another era again? Do we return to normal or, or what? No one knows what's actually going to happen. So that is the motivation to actually study what is this system replacing and what is the uh, practicalities? So this is the report that I actually um, wrote. This actually started out as a short, short 50 page report, but my review panel kept giving me a hard time about things that were not included and it blew out to the size it is now. Physical tasks that were done in um, industrially by fossil fuels, that what really happened here? And what was the true scope of useful work? So if we were to knock out fossil fuels, what useful work would have to be done in its place? So then I assembled all the non-fossil fuel systems that I could get hold of to actually replace the work in direct replacement that are actually industrially stable. And then I calculated the quantity of electrical power we would need to do all that charge electric batteries, make the hydrogen, etc. Now, the original study had an energy mix the same as 2018, scaled up to the new capacity. Since then, and what I'm showing today is the next generation of energy mix that's based on an um, IEA projection. So in this report, we have number of vehicles by class, number and size of batteries, an understanding of when you'd use an electric vehicle and when you'd use a hydrogen fuel cell, estimates of both rail and the maritime shipping fleet for both electrical systems and hydrogen systems, which means you can compare the two. And how do we phase out power generation for say oil, gas and coal and heating? I also examined the possibility of expanding the nuclear power plant fleet. Like, is this uh, possible? And the, the simple answer to that is we need the nuclear power fleet to expand a little bit, but it cannot replace fossil fuels. It will not expand in time. And we have issues of handling spent nuclear fuel at large volumes. So then there was an assessment of biofuels. Can biofuel save us? The answer is no. And plastics and fertilizers were looked at as well. So all of that is in one place internally referenced.